is from Revelation 2, 1 through 5, which reads the following. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who have claimed to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Our proposition for today is rather simple. And it is the call to seek and save the lost is a call to consistency and endurance. How did the church of Ephesus lose their first love? It's because of a lack of consistency and endurance. Remember, the call is not just for a moment but it is a call for a lifetime. It's easy to run for a short time. No matter how out of shape you are, you could probably run fast for a short time. It's more difficult to run a bit slower for a moderate amount of time. But it's very difficult to run very slowly. I mean, at a turtle's pace for a very long time. Try it out. Try to run at a turtle pace for two or three hours. It's very difficult. Even if you're running at a snail's pace, it's hard to do for 24 hours. Marathon running requires the most endurance and consistency. Marathon running requires mental toughness to get you through the time. As the time goes, your mind begins to wonder. And as your mind begins to wonder, it can interrupt the biomechanics of your body continuing to run and to run and to run. You can get bored over time. You have to have the mental toughness to get through the time. It requires physical stamina to do marathon running to get you through the pain. You know, we watch these professional marathon runners and we think that they don't feel pain, but they do. They feel pain, but they have learned how to have the physical stamina to push through the pain when they feel it. The pain and the cramps, uh, the aches and the exhaustion. Um, I remember, it may be hard to believe now uh, with all the weight I've gained through COVID, but when I did endurance, bicycling and when I first started doing it they told me that at the rest stops they had pickle juice and I said to myself oh my who wants to drink pickle juice uh, but but when you feel the cramps uh, at 50 miles in and a hundred mile ride you will grab the pickle juice and you will drink it with a glad heart cramps aches exhaustion you must have the physical stamina to run a marathon. Before Jesus was elevated to his throne of glory, he left us with a commission that I've talked about for the past few weeks. A commission is defined as the following, an instruction or command or the authority to perform a task. Jesus commissioned us in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now, for those of you who have been baptized, for those of you who have come into the Lord, 
I want you to think back to how you were when you got out of that water. Now, if you were anything like me, when you got out of that water, you were fired up. You wanted to tell everybody about your faith, your neighbors, the people in the grocery store, people in traffic, your coworkers, everybody. Nobody was safe from you. No one, everybody you knew had to understand Jesus Christ came to save them. You were fired up. Who else was like that? Raise your hand. Show of hands. Who else was like that? Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. But over time, some folks, their light tends to dim. Over time, that fire settles down. And people reorient and start to focus on other things that are truly distractions from the true mission. Because consistency and endurance is tough. And this is what happened to the church in Ephesus. And Jesus tells the messenger for that church, the pastor of that church, he tells them that they had done a lot of things right, but over time they had lost their first love and they needed to regain it. They needed to regain their fire. In our era, People lose their faith because of the pressures of society, sometimes the hypocrisy of believers that they experience. Some even say that, that there's no need to spread the gospel of Christ in the world today. The church in Ephesus had fought hard against the Nicolaitans' false doctrine, but eventually they too became weary, and it's hard because doing anything for a long time is difficult. Yeah, yeah. Staying consistent for a duration of time is challenging. It's hard, especially in today's world when the simple act of believing in God can make you the victim of ridicule and bashing. This has taken its toll. The Gallup data shows us this. It says that in the time from 2008 and 2010, 73% of Americans born between 1945 were church members, born before 1945 were church members. That number has dropped to 66% in 2018 to 2020. Different generations have different membership drops. Listen to this. The baby boomers dropped from 63% to 58%. All right? During that same time frame, as did the membership of the Generation X dropped from 57% to 50%. But listen to this. My generation, the millennial generation, my generation has dropped from 51% to 36%. The drop is even more drastic for Generation Z. The data is still coming in for them. It's clear that people are losing their first love in Christ. And I want you to know today that we must endure through the pressures of society. We must endure w through waning interests. We must endure past traumatic experiences to remain committed to our first love. That is my simple thesis for today. Endurance is the ability to stay in the race despite the challenges. Yes, there are societal pressures, and faith is no longer as popular as it used to be. Yes, you might have experienced some blows and some hits and some hard hits. Maybe you're possibly dealing even with some church hurt. But endurance is continuing to stay in the marathon despite your misstep, despite your cramp, despite your competitor who shoved you and stepped on your heel, through it all, remaining committed to the race. 
Jesus put it like this. But he or she that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. The question for today is how does one remain committed to their first love despite the challenges of society, trauma, and discouragement? One remains committed by remembering the mission. Search and rescue teams go through a lot. Search and rescue teams are, are, are always doing something. Something is always happening for search and rescue teams in America and across the world. There's always someone who was lost. There's always someone who was injured. People get lost or injured while on excursions. And search and rescue teams uh, go out to find them, to save them. They have to watch, however, some people die. Um, they don't successfully find everybody. Um, search and rescue teams sometimes have to watch, look and search for days uh, to only find uh, someone who they got to too late. And they deal with this over and over and over again. Search and rescue teams are not for people who are faint of heart. Um, it's not for people who are faint of heart. But despite all the ups and downs, if you're on a search and rescue team, you must stay committed to the mission. Even when you must search for a person that is behind enemy lines, where you have to go past opposition, where you have to go through people who don't like you, who don't want you to find the person. You must stay committed to the mission. When you have to go past enemy lines and there's a chance you can be taken captive yourself, but you still must go to find the one who is lost. There are search and rescue teams and they can have every excuse to quit they could give it. They could say, I'm traumatized by how we failed in the past, or I'm hurt that we didn't get to the person soon enough, or I'm afraid to go behind enemy lines, or I'm scared of this, or I'm afraid to go seek him out, or I'm just flat out tired. But they don't because they know that a life is at stake. With us, there's something even greater than just a life, but a soul. They remain committed to their mission, and so should we. Here's an article from the History Collection on an operation called Operation Jericho. In World War II, precision bombing was nowhere near as sophisticated as it was today. While today's bombs can be dropped almost on a pinhead, in the 1940s it was often the case of drop and hope for the best. In Operation Jericho, however, not only did the pilots involved have the courage to attempt to bomb the outer walls of a French prison in which they knew resistance fighters were being held by Nazis, but they also had the skill, perhaps a slice of good fortune, well to pull it off. This operation has gone down in history as one of the most audacious rescue missions of the whole war. It was 1943 and the Nazis were still in control of France and the area around the city of Armenians most resistance cells had been rounded up and by the end of by the end of the year in part as a result of nazi cult espionage efforts but mainly because of brave men and women who have been betrayed by collaborators around christmas time word got back to the allied command that as many as 100 resistance fighters were to be executed on february 19 1943 the free french petition the Royal Air Force to carry out a precision raid of the Armenians' prison to help the imprisoned men escape. After much deliberation, the plan was given the go-ahead. The mission name Operation Jericho was passed to the men of the 2nd Tactical Air Force, a small but skilled section of the resistance, uh, resistance uh, operation. They were advised by locals that the prison guards were based in a separate building the intelligence suggested that by hitting munition dumps, the prison doors could be made to swing open. If the outer walls were also destroyed, the prisoners had a chance to escape. 
From the start, however, the officers in charge acknowledged that there would be casualties. An estimated 700 prisoners were inside, however. Most of them were sentenced to death anyway. It was argued that if, any, if only a portion of them, if only a portion made it out, the whole mission would be a success. Under the command of Group Captain Percy Charles Picard, the RAF attacked on February 18th. They flew in at lunchtime when the guards were eating lunch in the mess hall. A first wave of mosquito planes successfully breached their outer walls. A second wave attacked the nearby railway station, knocking it out. The final wave of mosquito planes hit the guards' hut. Picard flew over the site one last time, checking the damage. Satisfied, he turned homewards. However, his plane took a direct hit and went down, killing both Picard and his navigator. At the end of the day, some 255 prisoners made it out. Some were recaptured by the Nazis later on. They were helped by the fact that the attack on the railroad station meant that reinforcement needed two extra hours to get on the scene. An unknown number of Nazi guards were also killed. The daring and audacity, the daring and audacity of the rescue mission cannot be disputed, nor can the skill of the men involved. I read this story because I want to point out a few things. Um, that this search and rescue mission was against, uh, was against great odds. Uh, they were against great odds, but they still went in with their common mission to search and to find. I want to also point out that out of the 700 people, they were only able to save 250, but they considered that to be a success. I want to also point out that although they freed 250, some were recaptured again, but they still consider the mission one of the greatest search and rescue missions in American history. It's a success if you search and find just one person, yes. just one coin, just one lost sheep is worth it. Even if you pass out 1,000 flyers, or if you have 100 Bible studies, or whatever, just one makes it worth it. I want to also point out that some were recaptured again, and that's how it is sometimes. You see, the devil is not pleased with people getting free. Oppressors never want to see people free from the grips of their oppression. That's why precious souls struggle when they first come to Christ because the devil is at them to recapture them and bring them back under him. This is why we must be gentle with babes in Christ. We must be gentle with folks who visit us. We must be an example in front of them and we must help them on their road to discipleship and maturation. It says, however, that they rescue more than one. They rescued 255. The mission was a success, and the reason why they were able to do it is because they remained committed to their mission despite the odds that they were up against, despite all the horror and failures that they had already experienced in the war, they remained committed. I just want to say that we must remain committed to the mission even though the odds may seem against us. You remain committed even when you feel beleaguered and beaten down by spiritual warfare. Truth is, a lot of people have been engaging in spiritual warfare for a long time. For some people, the spiritual warfare started for you when you were a child. The devil didn't wait till you were an adult. Some of us started getting attacked spiritually when we were just children. Devil knew your potential. He knew what you could do. And the attacks started for you when you were of a very young age. You might have experienced trauma, hardship, and pain that was designed and intended to pull you away from God. And if it didn't start for you when you were a child, 
it definitely started by the time you came to Christ. And if you've experienced enough spiritual warfare over time, you can become battle-worn. The sheen of service God can become dual to you and possibly mundane. However, you must push through that because that's also a trick of Satan. You must push through like the search and rescue teams have to do every day. And the reason why we must push through and not allow for the attacks of Satan to disenchant us is because there are still people who are lost and held captive behind enemy lines. If the devil can immobilize us, then he will successfully keep them captive. That's why we must remain committed to the mission today. That's why today I stand here and I boldly rebuke the spirit of discouragement, the spirit of cynicism, the spirit of fear, the spirit of negativity that keeps so many from our mission. The mission is too critical. The mission is too important. People are lost and dying in their sin, and we must remain committed to the mission to seek and save the lost. I'm thankful today, however, that we don't have to go about this alone. It's not an individual effort, but it's a collective effort. One remains committed by remaining dedicated to the team. Now, for sports enthusiasts, you know that there are some sports where it's just you. It's just you and the other people that you're competing against, uh, the other person. For instance, uh, t uh, tennis, you with a racket, unless you have playing doubles, but you, single tennis, you with a racket playing against somebody on the other side. Boxing and MMA fighting. It's just you in the ring with somebody else. All right? Golfing. Is golfing like that, Reverend? You and your mind, as he says. Your success is primarily based on you. But then there are sports that are team sports. Football, basketball, baseball, hockey, etc. You cannot be successful without your teammates doing their best. And I want you to know today that the Bible is very concerned with how we treat each other, how we treat each other, how we treat one another, how we treat other believers. In fact, people on the outside are watching to see how we treat one another. The devil has a vested interest in us being at odds with one another spreading malice about each other, sowing distrust and discord with each other. And any time a person behaves like that, they're really doing the work of Satan and God is not pleased with it. The Bible displays a witness regarding how we should treat each other. The Bible teaches us through these what's called one another passages. And when you go home, if you get on Google, I encourage you to Google one another passages. Passages from the New Testament that are all about how we should treat one another. The one that shows up the most is love one another. It shows up 16 times that we ought to love one another. Then there's be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. Live in harmony with one another. Build up one another. Be like-minded towards one another. Accept one another. Admonish one another. Greet one another care for one another, serve one another, bear one another's burdens, forgive one another, be patient with one another, speak the truth and love to one another, be kind and compassionate to one another, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, submit to one another, consider others better than yourselves, look to the interests of one another, bear with one another, teach one another, comfort one another, encourage one another, exhort one another, stir up 
one another, to love and good works, show hospitality to one another, employ the gifts that God has given us for the benefit of one another, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, pray for one another, confess your faults to one another. All of these are New Testament scriptures. All of these are addressing the early church, our spiritual ancestors. This is how God wants us to treat one another. There are also some negative commands. What you heard were the positive commands. Here are the negative commands. Not meaning negative in the sense of bad, but negative in the sense of do not do this to one another. Do not lie to one another. Stop passing judgment on one another. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, you will be destroyed by each other. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Do not slander one another. Don't grumble against each other. We do all this because we, in a real sense, are members of one another. We are a part of one another's body. Working together as a team is a winning strategy. When Joe Dumars was hired by the struggling Detroit Pistons to be the team president, I'm doing it. I ain't scared. If you, if you misquote a scripture, no one bats an eye, but if you get the Detroit Pistons story wrong, <laughs> I'm going to do it. Joe DeMars was hired by the struggling Detroit Pistons to be the team president after the 1999-2000 season. He could, have, he could not have predicted what awaited his team four seasons later. The Pistons had not advanced beyond the first round of the playoffs since 1991 and had missed the playoffs in four of the previous eight seasons prior to DeMars being hired but everything was about to change. And the, the epitome of team ball over star power, the Pistons would become one of the most unlikely champions when they defeated a lo the Los Angeles Lakers team, sporting four future Hall of Famers, four in one in the 2004 finals. The victory is considered one of the greatest upsets in US pro sports history. The groundwork for the Pistons historic championship began in Dumars' first offseason as president. He made several trades that were puzzling at the time, but in his trade, every one, he was prioritizing building a team. He made several trades that seemed lopsided at the time, but he remained focused on developing a team first and not necessarily star power. DeMar's focus on building a team and his team building focus paid dividends. The, the Pistons finished the season at 54-28, easily handle, handling the Milwaukee Bucks in the first round and rallied from a 3-2 deficit against the defending Eastern Conference champion New Jersey Nets in the semifinals to advance. In the East final series, in which no team would score more than 85 points, Detroit made the Indiana Pacers play a style that they weren't comfortable with. The Pistons would win the series in six games to make their first trip to the final since the days of the, the 1990s Pistons. Facing a heavily favored Lakers team, the Pistons were considered to be no match for Los Angeles on paper. With all-stars such as Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant, the late Kobe Bryant, as well as future Hall of Famers such as Karl Malone and Gary Payton, both in the twilight of their careers in search of their first championship, the Lakers were expected to easily dispatch the Pistons for their fourth title in five years. However, the situation was more complicated than it appeared on paper because O'Neal and Bryant's relationship was on the brink of crumbling and with a cast of ill-supporting talent, the Lakers were in reality a group of individuals. Detroit was a team in the truest sense. The Lakers were a group of individuals, but Detroit was a team in the truest sense. 
This is what uh, Billups says. He says, they may have had better individual players, but we always felt we were the better team. Okay. Detroit swarmed the Lakers throughout the series with team defense and pass first offense. Los Angeles simply couldn't match. The Pistons would take three of their four victories by double digits and easily closed out the series with a 100 to 87 victory. It's about players, said Brown, after winning his first NBA championship after 21 years of professional coaching. This sport is about players playing the right way and showing kids that you can be a team and be successful. It's great for our league. This article from NBA.com. The Lakers weren't working together as a team. As, as Billup says, he says that they may have had better individuals, but we always felt we were a better team. And because of the Pistons being a better team, they found success. The feud between Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal contributed to the team losing the NBA championship and this great upset in sports history. The culture of individualism, rugged individualism that was within the Lakers franchise that year contributed to their team not succeeding and not winning the championship that year. You see, uh, they were both two leaders on the team, both the late Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal, but their conflict made a huge impact. Um, this is why in the church, these one another passages matter so much. Because they, they make us a good team. And if we're not, if we're at odds with one another, we're working towards failure and not success. There's an old African proverb that says, when the, ele when the elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. When the deacons are at odds with the trustees, when the trustees are at odds with the deacons, when the pastors are at odds with the deacons, when the deacons are at odds with the pastor, when the leaders of auxiliaries and board chairs are at odds with trustees and trustees at odds with them, the list goes on, you get it. When these groups are at odds with one another, the membership suffers, the children suffer. Those struggling and just need a church home, a place where they can be renewed, they suffer. The mission of seeking and saving the lost suffers and people become distracted by being at odds with one another. So distracted that they cannot even come together to fulfill the great commission that Christ has handed to us. Being a good team is an attractant by itself. Everyone wants to be on a good team. What makes a good, successful team? Well, here, here's an article that's written for coaches. It's, on a, it's, it's from a coaching network, championship coaching network. It gives, gives seven C's of championship team building. It says that the first C is common goal. It says that championship teams have a singular common focus. You have a singular common focus. Obviously, for many teams, the common goal is to win the conference and or national championship. This is the team's primary, primary specified overt goal. And all the other goals revolve around it. This goal is firmly embraced by all members of the team, coaching staff, and support staff. Everyone understands that this is the direction and destination that the team is moving toward. The players understand that their individual goals must fit within the framework of the team's goals. So your personal goals do not overcome the team's goals. You come together around a common goal, and I think that Jesus Christ gave it to us in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, to go out and make disciples, teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that's a common goal for church folks if I ever heard one. The second C is commitment. He says, while some seasons may start with the entire team focused on a common goal, rarely do they end up that way. 
Commitment is probably the single most important factor that differentiates championship teams, coaches, athletes, businesses, schools, marriages, you name it, from the mediocre. It's much too easy to say you want to win the championship, and it's a whole other thing to put in the blood, the sweat, the tears necessary to pursue the championship, especially when obstacles and adversity strike. Continual commitment to the team's common goal is one of the toughest areas of team building. Championship teams buy into the mission at every level and make the mission their own. The players and the coaches work hard and pay their dues because they want to, not because they have to. In addition to their commitment, the team members feel a sense of personal group accountability. The players have a clear understanding of how their individual churches uh, their individual, their individual decisions influence the collective psyche and success of the team. There is a true sense that if a player is slacking off, he or she is not just hurting herself or himself, but her entire team. The players feel a sense of responsibility and an obligation to give it their best. Now, I, I believe that if, if athletes uh, can have this kind of commitment to a temporal organization of a sports franchise, then what kind of commitment should we ought to have to an eternal organization that's under God? The second C is complementary roles. In other words, no big eyes or little U's. Championship teams are comprised of several individuals who willingly take pride in playing in a variety of roles. Now, I didn't heard this before somewhere. I didn't heard that. I didn't heard somewhere. I've heard something like this. Maybe you all have heard. Maybe you remember where you heard it from. These roles, when played in concert and harmony, led to team success. Thus, each player is assigned specific positions and responsibilities that help determine the entire team's success. While individually they are not solely responsible for the team's success or failure, collectively each role forms a synergistic whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. Somewhere I heard that you are a body, and every part of the body is important. Have you heard that? Does it sound familiar to you, Reverend Beeman, <laughs> Reverend Pennington? The fourth C is clear communication. A fourth characteristic of championship teams is clear communication. Successful teams communicate successfully both on and off the field. The on-field communication helps them perform more efficiently and effectively. Players must communicate signs, the number of outs, where to throw the ball, and call fly balls to perform successfully. Off the field, players need to continually monitor the team's effectiveness, modify things if necessary, and celebrate successes. The fifth C is constructive conflict. Along with effective communication, championship teams have the ability to keep conflict under control. Often coaches and players are able to use conflict constructively to further develop and strengthen the team. The, la the, the second to last C is cohesion. They find reasons to stay together. A sixth characteristic shared by many teams is that they genuinely like and respect each other. The players like to spend time with each other outside of the scheduled practice and game times. They find reasons to stay together, like going to the movie, studying together, hanging out. And the seventh C is credible coaching. Finally, it takes a credible coach to develop and orchestrate and monitor all the other C's of championship building. You as a coach play a critical role in helping the team arrive at a common goal, monitoring and maintaining your players' commitment, assigning and appreciating roles, communicating with the team, keeping conflict under control, and promoting your team's chemistry and cohesion. The team must have a leader who they believe in and has the skills necessary to get the most from the team. A credible coach creates an effective environment that allows the team to perform at their full potential. The seven C's could easily be adapted to the church. If we're going to complete the mission, we must remain dedicated to the mission, but we also must remain dedicated to the team. Here's how Jesus put it in John 13, 33 through 35. Jesus said, my little children, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. You love one another. By this shall all men and women know that you are my disciples, 
by how you love one another. Jesus shows us that our love for each other is an attractant for others because people want to be in a loving community. People want to be in a loving organization. People are searching for this love all over the place. They're looking for it. They're searching in all the wrong places. They want this love. It is an attractant. And when people see how much we love one another, they say, can I just get a piece of that kind of love that you have for one another? How, how do coats grow? How do gangs grow? How do terrorist organizations grow? They pretend to love one another. I say pretend because if I really love you, I'm not going to give you some poisonous Kool-Aid. If I really love you, I'm not going to tell you to throw your life away to senseless gun violence. If I really love you, I'm not going to tell you to strap bombs on yourself and go blow yourself up. No. If I really love you, I'm not going to tell you those things. But folks join those organizations just so they can have a little love. See, that's what Jesus is talking about. If you love one another, they'll know that you are my disciples. They'll want to be with you. They want to be a part of you because people are desperate for love. In Christ, you find love. And with Christ's community, you find love and you find life more abundantly. Some Christians' faith commitment has led them to physical death because of persecution. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., his faith commitment led to his death. People like Diedrich Bonhoeffer, his faith commitment led to his death because of persecution. But the abundance of life isn't just for this physical time. It's also for eternity. See, in Christ, you receive a richer physical life, a life with more meaning, a life where you find a different way of viewing things, a way of viewing things that's less anxiety-inducing, a more comforting and inspiring way of viewing things because you know that you are saved and that despite whatever happens to you, you'll be okay because all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. And even the grave cannot beat you because in the cross, Christ uh, conquered the grave. And so here we are with life and life more abundantly in our physical experience now, but also in our eternal experience forever. So why would anyone not want that? Because everyone wants community. People are seeking honest genuine, loving communities. People are dying to find such a community. They're seeking it in wrong places. And we need to be unequivocally clear that you can find a real community of love right here. You can find that. You can find that championship team right here. King Jesus says that they will know that you are my disciples by how you love each other. He tells us to love each other. He tells us to love each other, yet we also remain committed by dedicating ourselves to him. One remains committed by staying dedicated to the king. A soldier that's considered a good one is one that takes his orders and completes them. Simple as that. A repentant needs to be a Marine. Is that correct for the Marines? A soldier or Marine or seaman or airman that's considered a good one is one that takes his orders and completes them. We have a king in Jesus. And unlike earthly kings, King Jesus is just. King Jesus is righteous. King Jesus is loving. Unlike earthly kings who want to rob from the people, steal from the people, lie to the people, take advantage of the people. King Jesus instead wants to give us, protect, forgive to us, protect us, and give us the truth and bless us. It's shocking that people will take orders from world power so easily with all of its corruption, 
yet resist to follow the commands of King Jesus with all of his righteousness. I want to know if the true soldiers of the Lord are here today ready to stand with Jesus. Can he say amen today? I want to know if the true soldiers of the Lord are here today ready to march on for Jesus. Can we say amen today? That despite all that we have experienced and the trauma and the things and all of these spiritual attacks, that we're still on the battlefield of our, of our Lord, that we're still a soldier for Jesus. Can we say amen today? If that's you, if you said amen, then always remember that King Jesus has given us the orders. King Jesus has given us marching orders to go and search and rescue those who are lost. We must follow through with those orders. We don't want to be AWOL, absent, without leave. We don't want to be MIA, missing in action. There's a lot of churches that are MIA. People starting to write books about it. They starting to have podcasts about it. They say all the churches in the communities, yet the community's doing so bad. That's because some of us are MIA. Missing in action. How does one stay committed to the mission even when it's tough and challenging? One stays committed to the mission by remaining committed to the one who sent you. We have been sent by Christ because Christ wants to find those who are lost. I have orders from the king that I must follow through. I don't have time to argue over the price of a bean. I don't have time to get distracted by the past. My mission isn't to win every debate. My mission isn't to look as smart as I can look. My mission isn't to dress better than everybody that I see. My mission isn't to sit around and just look good. My mission isn't just to go around and chase photo ops. My mission isn't to hold grudges. My mission isn't to spread malice. My mission, my mission isn't to build my own empire. No, my mission, your mission is to make disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It's right here in front of us. We must simply do it. A school teacher in England tells a charming story around Christmas time. She supervised the construction of a manger scene in a corner of the classroom. The children participated happily in the project. They also enjoyed casting characters for the drama depicting the nativity. The teacher noticed one boy was particularly enamored by it all and was forever going back and forth to the scene. At last, she asked him if there was anything bothering him. He said, no. She said, are there any questions you would like to ask? Yes, he said. What I'd like to know is, where does Jesus fit in? My question is similar to the little boy. How does Christ fit into your life? If Christ, is he on the forefront? Or is he just a footnote? Is he sitting on in our minds all the day long? Or is he just an afterthought? Is he our core curriculum? Or is he just an elective? No, Jesus is everything. And he's worthy of our total submission. He's worthy of our total praise. He's worthy of our complete obedience. He's worthy of us following him. He's worthy to be king. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He was there at the beginning and will be there at the end. Where does God fit into your life? He is our everything. Therefore, we are committed to him. I'm committed to his team you should be committed to his team. I'm committed to his mission. We should be committed to his mission. I am committed. Can somebody say, I am committed? It doesn't matter what the times may throw at me. They may laugh at my faith and ridicule my faith. They may tell me I'm stupid because I follow Christ. They may tell me I'm not sophisticated enough because I follow Christ. They may call me a fool because I follow Christ. Well, that's okay. I'll be a fool for Jesus today. It ain't about going, it ain't going to let nobody turn me around from Jesus. I'm on fire for Jesus. 
get your fire for Jesus. If you need to regain your fire for Jesus, don't let anyone take your fire for Jesus away because Jesus is worthy. He's worthy today. He was worthy yesterday. He's worthy tomorrow. Can somebody say with me that he is worthy? Can we stand if you believe that he's worthy? Can you clap with me if you believe that he is worthy? He's worthy. Therefore, I ain't going to let nobody turn me around, turn me around from following Jesus. Therefore, I'm going to stay committed. We're going to stay committed to his mission. We're going to stay committed to his people. And we're going to stay committed to him. Regain your fire. Grab hold to the first love that you had. And watch us not only change our street, but transform our city. Come forward today if you're ready to accept Christ in your life. If you want to come back to Christ as well, the doors of the church are open to you. Come forward now as we sing our invitation hymn.